Hey everyone, I am Julien Boussard. I'm a PhD student in the Stats Department at Columbia University. And together with Erdem Varol, we're presenting our paper that's been accepted at NeurIPS 2021 on spikes, uh, 3D localization, and improved motion estimation for neuropixel recording. The goal of localization is first to compute features that will help better clustering spikes and outputting better quality spike trains. Secondly, we want to have accurate localization of spikes to allow for precise and efficient motion estimation. And finally, it allows us to build uh, cool diagnostic and visualization tools for NeuroPixels spike sorters. Many spike sorters use center of mass uh, as a method for localizing spikes, which is basically a weighted average of spike amplitudes over several channels. But this method cannot localize spikes outside the probe, and it tends to aggregate uh, all the different spikes together. Another localization technique recently proposed at NeurIPS 2019 by Ervid Seal uses amortized variational inference to infer positions of the spikes. We show comparisons to these methods in our paper. On the registration side, the methods that are used and implemented in different spike sorters, such as YAS and KiloSort, largely rely on spike rasters to estimate uh, the motion. A recent decentralized registration approach has been proposed by Varol et al at ICAS 2020. So how are we doing this uh, localization? So we model the neuron as a point source of the signal. And under this approximation, the spike amplitudes recorded on each channel will be inversely proportional to the distance of the neuron to the channels. It allows us to perform triangulation to estimate the 3D locations of the neuron. So this model is a bit simple, but it allows to reliably approximate the position of the source of an action potential. And moreover, if you think of a neuron which has a long axon along the probe, for example, all of its spikes will have the same elongated shape where we will see high amplitude all along the probe. And given our model, all of these spikes, since they have similar shape, will be clustered together, will be localized in the same area. So, we find that model mismatch is not a source of noise for the localization clusters. Since our triangulation method relies on amplitudes of the spikes, it is necessary to denoise the waveforms to get their true amplitudes. So we use a NN denoiser, a neural net denoiser that is implemented in YAS. So the left figure shows examples of raw waveforms in blue and the corresponding denoised waveforms in red. So there are three waveforms, one on each line, for which we show 10 channels, and the waveforms are here flattened. And you can see that the neural network does two very important things. So first, it removes noise. And secondly, it removes collided spikes. There's a lot of collisions in neuropixel recordings that arise when two neighboring neurons fire at the same time. And then the detected waveforms correspond to the sum of the two signals. Since we want to localize each of the collided spikes separately, we want to remove the collided waveform before computing the amplitudes of each spike. On the right figure, what we've done is we've taken templates or clean spikes and we've added raw snippets of data to get you know, raw waveforms. And then we've computed the amplitudes of these waveforms before and after denoising and compared them with the true amplitudes of the template. What we see is that the red amplitude, which corresponds to the denoised amplitude, are much closer to the true amplitudes. And this denoiser outputs very reliable uh, waveforms and, and retains the true amplitude of the waveforms. So now that we have the correct amplitude for the waveforms, the next step is to perform triangulation and infer the parameters x, y, z that corresponds to the 3D locations, and alpha, which corresponds to the brightness of the cell, right, if the neuron is a high amplitude neurons or a small amplitude neurons. Note that the neuropixel probe is in a plane, and so it's not possible to determine on which side of the probe the neuron will be. So then y is relative, right? It's, a, it's an absolute value. And we look at the signal amplitude on 20 channels located around the main channel of the spike, and we minimize the sum of square differences between the amplitude on each channel and alpha divided by the distance of the neuron to this channel to infer x, y, z, and alpha. 
And our method that we use is least square optimization after initializing with center of mass. On simulated data where we simulate uh, 3D positions and the corresponding PTP on all channels, we find that this optimization method recovers perfectly the four parameters X, Y, Z, and alpha, which shows that it is a suited optimization method for this task. Now, let's look at the result. The left panel here shows the localization features of the spikes along the NeuroPixels probe. The channels of the NeuroPixel probe correspond to the orange dots. What we see is that the localization induces clusters of spikes. And what we want ideally is each of these clusters to correspond to one neuron. Uh, so we've isolated some of these point sets. We've run Gaussian mixture mo model clustering on them um, so that it would reflect you know, the visual impression. And we've looked at the waveforms corresponding to each cluster. So in these four boxes that we've explored, one, two, three, four, you know, we see uh, different localization in these clusters. And on the right panel, we see the waveforms for each cluster that actually show distinctive shapes, right? Showing that each of these localization in this cluster correspond to a different unit. Now, in this video, what we've done is we've plotted in four different panels, the spike uh, localization features and maximum amplitude of the spike colored by uh, clusters in the left column, uh, the clusters we're using by running yes on this data, and then amplitude or brightness of the cell on the three right panels. So this video was made using Datovis, which is a tool developed by Thierry Rosson at the International Brain Lab, which is optimized for large point clouds. And with this you know, tool, we can zoom, we can scroll around the, along the probe, we can rotate the probe, uh, examine specific clusters to find, let's say, any oversplit or overmerge of units. We can scroll through time, we can you know, aggregate time points. So this is a very nice visualization tool, which can be used you know, for evaluating the quality of spectrum and visualizing neural activity. Now I will let uh, Erdem talk about motion estimation and registration. Hi everyone, my name is Ardan Barol and I'll be presenting the motion estimation part of this presentation. So now that we have the estimation of unit locations using the methods that Julian has talked about, one of the critical problems in spike sorting today is the estimation and correction of motion artifacts. To see how well our motion estimation is doing, we ran our method on NeuroPixels 2.0 data from Nick Steinmetz's lab from Washington. In this data set, the NeuroPixels probe was attached to a mechanical actuator to simulate sawtooth pattern of motion, as you can see here. To estimate motion, we first generate three-dimensional point clouds for spikes observed in each one second of data. Given these sets of point clouds, we can then estimate how much displacement occurs between any pairs of time bins using the iterative closest point algorithm, or ICP for short. To make ICP more robust and faster, we also prune the dense point clouds to generate core sets for each time bin. And these core sets display the exemplary spikes that summarize the overall spatial distribution of spikes in each, each time bin. Once we have pairwise translation estimations from each time bin to in any other time bin, we can then estimate the global position of a time bin using the decentralized registration technique that we detailed in this recent ICAST paper. Alternatively, we can convert our point clause into images by generating three-dimensional histograms of spike locations and amplitudes, as you can see in this middle column. One advantage of this representation is that we can now employ image-based registration algorithms to estimate motion. However, one of the problems of generating images using these localization point clouds is that the image estimates that we see in the middle column is a noisy estimate of an actual image of units in space. And the noise that we can estimate here can be, we can mo we model it as Poisson noise that basically shows that some of this information is missing with, with Poisson distribution. To generate a denoised image, we can then perform variance stabilization of this noisy Poissonian image to, to transform the noise model into a Gaussian noise. 
And we can do this using the ANSCOM transformation. And once the noise has been transformed into one that is Gaussian, we can use Gaussian image denoising techniques off the shelf and techniques such as BM3D or non-local means. And this can, these can be used to generate a denoised localization image as you can see in the bottom row. We can then use these denoised images generated for each second of data to once again estimate pairwise displacement estimations. And, and, and using these pairwise displacement estimations, we can estimate the global positioning using the decentralized image registration paradigm, as we mentioned before. We can compare our motion estimates to motion estimates obtained if we had used the localization methods that Julian talked about previously, including the method from Hurwitz et al. from New York 2019, as well as the center of mass approach. Uh, one added benefit of our localization method over the others, as you can see here, is that we also get this partial depth estimation which could potentially enable better registration by providing additional features to get matches between any two pairs of images from different time bins. Other methods only provide two dimensional planar localizations. And if the, if the units are really localized in a three dimensional volumetric space, then this two dimensional representation could be too compressive to accurately reflect the motion patterns we observe. And motion estimates using these three different localization methods yields slightly different results. All methods recover the sawtooth pattern of vertical motion, as you can see in the left column. However, since methods compress information much differently along the horizontal axes, we get differences in horizontal motion, as you can see in the, in the middle column. Interestingly, our method also enables us to estimate depth-based motion, as you can see in the right column where we can estimate how much the probe moves closer and away from the units it's sensing. While motion estimates alone do not tell us which method is doing better in correcting for motion, we can apply the negative of the motion estimates to our data by interpolating the new spike locations based on the shifted positions. And after, after shifting all our data with the negative of the motion, we can generate some representation of the of the spikes over time to see how much residual motion is left. So to visualize residual motion, we generate these spike raster plots where we show the average spike amplitude at different depths and along the y-axis and the time in the x-axis. And ideally in these raster plots, we wanna see just a straight flat lines for all the spikes, meaning that their depth and their amplitudes are stable over time. And so looking at these rasters for these three different methods, we can see that our method qualitatively and quantitatively minimizes residual motion. And one way to quantify residual motion is to compute the average of time bin uh, data from these rasters and compute its correlation for every single individual time bin. And we can also compute the root mean square error for individual time bin to the average time bin. And ideally, the correlation of, it, of any of the motion corrected time bin should be high to the average time bin if there's no motion left. And the residual error for each individual time bin to the average time bin should be low, again, if there's no difference between these two, two representations because there's no more motion left. And along these two metrics, we see that our method yields raster plus that are relatively more stable over time compared to the other methods. Another way to evaluate motion estimation quality is by visualizing the average localization image before and after motion correction and computing its entropy. We can see that through our method, the localization image gains much sharpness after motion correction, yielding brighter and more globular shapes for units. Whereas the other two localization images, before and after images from re after doing registration do not show as much gain in entropy. To qualitatively visualize our motion correction results, we can generate videos of the localization point clouds before and after motion correction for different regions of the brain. Here we can clearly see the stabilization of motion in both the hippocampus, the thalamus, and the cortex. And in the top, you see the point clouds uh, in, the, in a raw format that shows the motion 
in the middle, you see the localization images before doing motion correction. In the bottom, you see localization images after doing motion correction, showing that the localization images are stable over time. So in summary, we observed that our method has been effective in localizing spiking units in both NeuroPixels 1 and NeuroPixels 2 probes compared to previous approaches for localization. We see that the gain in localization performance also translates to better motion correction in drifty data sets. As more and more neuroscience labs are adopting the NeuroPixels technology for their electrophysiology experiments, we hope that our technique can act as a valuable pre-processing step prior to spike sorting or any other downstream analyses that requires spike sorting. And one main reason we advocate this is that we have shown that clustering performance dramatically improves using the localization information we provide and the motion correction that we can uh, apply on the raw, raw data. So to deploy this technique in your spike sorting pipeline, please visit our GitHub page for the open source software. And with that, we'd like to thank all our collaborators that have provided valuable feedback and data to make this method possible. We especially thank our collaborator Nick Steinmetz at WashU for providing the testing data with the zigzag pattern, as well as Olivier Winter at the International Brain Lab for testing our code. We also acknowledge the Simons Foundation for our support and Columbia Zuckerman Institute for the awesome environment in which this research took place. And lastly, we'd like to thank you for tuning in and watching this video.